Hello and welcome to another episode of Open Studio. I'm your host, Martina Flora, and in this show, I have honest conversations with artists, designers, and creatives to uncover their story and the specific tactics they use to build a business around their skills and the work they love doing. Today, I'll be having a conversation with Lauren Hom. Lauren is a designer, letterer, and educator. A self-proclaimed artist with a business brain, she picked up hand lettering as a hobby while studying advertising at the School of Visual Arts. Over the next few years, and thanks to the power of internet, she leveraged a few clever passion projects into a thriving design career. Known for her bright color palettes, playful letter forms, and quirky copywriting, Lauren has created work for clients like Vans, Google, and Adobe. She loves sharing what she has learned with others through her blog, Instagram, and library of online courses. Next year, Lauren is heading to culinary school to expand her creative skill set and try something new. Lauren is an open book, and during this show, we touch on tons of topics, promoting your work, marketing, social media, developing confidence, passion projects, and so much more. She shared her journey that went from being at a job she wasn't happy with to going freelance and working as a lettering artist full-time and thriving at it. Lauren spoke about how passion projects help her get her work out there as she was studying, some tactics she used to land paid projects that she continues to use nowadays, and even a funny story from her first months taking a part-time gig, Walking Dogs. Having grown a big following on Instagram, she shared a clever approach that helps her have a healthy relationship with it while connecting with the right people. Lauren drops so many pearls of wisdom, and I'm sure you will love this episode with her as much as I enjoyed doing it. Enjoy this conversation with Lauren Holm. So hello, Lauren. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Martina. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I mean, there's so many topics I want to touch on. Um, you know, you have such an a great career as an artist. You are smart, you're talented, you have also a great talent for marketing yourself and um, spreading your artistic voice. And I want to touch on all of this on this show today. But before we get started, I like to, you know, I don't like to have my listeners waiting and I normally like to cut straight to the chase on the first question. So I'm going to ask you, how does an artist do you, how do you think an artist makes a good living with their art? Ooh, that is a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, I've thought about this so much, right? There's so many different ways to define a good living. I'm assuming we're talking about, you know, how do you support yourself financially from the art you want to be making because that's certainly part of the equation where mm. of course we all need to work to make money to live and enjoy our lives but ideally you want to do that making the kind of creative work you actually are excited about mm. and myself and like myself included and a lot of my friends have gotten into situations throughout our careers where we're making money, but it's actually not the work we want to be doing. And that's when you know you need to make some kind of adjustment in order to get yourself more aligned with spending your time doing the things you want to do. So early on in my career, I actually started out in advertising as an art director. I had gone to school mm -hmm. for that, and I was on this path to get a job at an agency. And I checked all the boxes, and I did all the things. I got my dream job, and six months in, I realized, like, oh, Yes, I'm paying my rent, I'm supporting myself, but this isn't how I want to be spending 40, okay, let's be honest, 60 hours a week. Mm, yes. <laughs> and so I decided I needed to do something, anything. Um, and luckily I had been doing lettering on the side all this, the entire time, um, starting from senior year of college. So mm. that was my natural plan B and I cranked that up and I was able to leave my job and <laughs> go do lettering full time and that's what I've been doing ever since. But in terms of how does an artist make a living from their work, um, I really do think it's baby steps. So step by step, you slowly make the work that you want to be getting paid for someday. You build the confidence, right? And maybe you have an inner circle who encourages you to share it online or even offline, right? Telling other people about your work, building a portfolio. 
Um, and you basically just need to get other people to see all this work that you would like to be getting paid for someday. And slowly over time, that typically leads to paid work, but the way that you publish your work and the way that you talk about your work online is certainly, uh, I think, the inroad to getting paid or, or to making a living from your artwork. That's amazing. That's also a loaded answer. So I would like to, <laughs> to unpack a little bit of Let's all do the that. things you, you have said uh, just now. So you, you mentioned that you started as a, you know, working at, in an advertising agency um, and you were working as an art director and you realized that you were not having fun at doing that. So you started to, you took your first steps towards um, changing that. So what, what were those first steps? What were those uh, first steps that took took you away from that space and led you into the direction of what you're doing nowadays? The first step that comes to mind actually that for me was the most pivotal one was admitting out loud to one of my friends that I'm not happy at my job. That took mm. six, it was six months in the making. I, I held it close to my chest. It felt wrong to say because it was my dream job for the last four years building up to this. My teachers told me that everyone else wanted this job, so I should be grateful. So I had all this brain garbage in my head about, well, okay, maybe the job's not so bad. Maybe I'm the one who's wrong and I'm ungrateful. But at a certain breaking point, I said it out loud to my best friend. And that was the moment that I actually started taking real action towards leaving the job. So those steps were starting to put together my lettering portfolio in a more serious way, starting to talk about my lettering work in a more serious way online, um, mm -hmm. saying that I was open to more freelance work, uh, starting to save more money, right, to be able to have a little more of a financial cushion uh, when I left my job. And a caveat, too, that I want to point out to your listeners is there's so many parts of my story, right? Um, one of the reasons I was able to leave my job so quickly, um, I mentioned like six months and then I left, I think, after nine or ten months, uh, was that at the end of college, I had actually landed a book deal for a project that I had started on a Tumblr blog. Um, for those mm -hmm. of you who are familiar with my work, it was called Daily Dishonesty. And it was just a hand lettering project where I was lettering all of the little white lies that my girlfriends and I would tell ourselves in college, like, I'll be there in five minutes, or calories don't count on the weekend, little little things like back, that back in 2012, right? Psst. Wondering how to land dream assignments? I'm running a free client outreach challenge to help you land your dream assignment in four days, even if you're just starting. If you're a lettering artist or illustrator and you have been struggling to land the right assignments or if you haven't even started because you think there's too much competition out there, you wonder where to find the clients or how to even start a conversation. Well, I have great news for you. Clients are hiring right now and they need your art to sell their products, connect with their audiences and tell their stories. But how can they find you if they don't know you're out there doing the awesome work you do? In this free four days challenge, I'm going to show you how to find those clients and turn your dream assignments into real assignments. Go to martinaflor.com slash challenge to join for free. We are starting soon. Go to martinaflor.com slash challenge and join. Now back to the show. And it caught a good wave of internet and I was publishing it a couple times a week and that ended up getting me a book deal by the time I graduated college. Mm. So I had a little nest egg. Um, I think I got paid $25,000 for that book. So I had money saved up as a 22 year old that most 22 year olds did not have. So that's a big reason why I was able to leave so quickly. But I would like to think that had I not had that, I would have just left maybe a year later or something, but who's to say? Um, but I really do think that saying it out loud to, to another human being was the number one step I took to making a change in my creative career. Um, and then the other practical steps, like, like we were talking about earlier, you can you know, look online for how to leave your job, you know, how to go freelance, all these things. And there are lots of practical steps and they're all good bits of advice. You know, networking, saving up money, um, putting your work out there. But I think that for anyone listening who might be in a similar position that I was in when I was unhappy at my job, 
saying it out loud to someone else is what like was the most pivotal step for me. So I encourage you to do the same if you're feeling those same feelings I was just describing. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I was I was actually recording. I'm recording like a series of solo episodes here on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, the last episode I recorded was about, you know, achieving your goals and overcoming imposter syndrome. And I think one of the biggest um, biggest things that I have learned in the last years is how powerful it is to to speak about your goals, to really write them down and yes. speak about them often, because it's also a way of reminding yourself and others where you're heading towards. Yes. Um, and I think what you just said is so, um, it's so important in that sense that you actually realize so many people is in their, uh, you know, they have a certain job or they do something and there's something that is not quite great and they don't know what it is and they also don't talk about it so already realizing that there's something wrong is the like a very important step towards change changing that right and oh, 100%. I, yes and i was i was just going writing down your your steps uh, or the steps that you took towards you know changing or pivoting careers in a way because you went from uh, working as an art director for an advertising agency to doing really, um, really personal work. You know, you you became an artist in a way, and you opened a freelance business as an artist. And you mentioned that you, you know, the first steps, but the first step was to verbalize this, to say to your friends, "Hey, I'm not happy about what I'm doing," and or with what I'm doing. And the second step was to start doing more of the work you want to do to build your lettering portfolio, right? And then building that financial cushion that you said that you had already in a way because of this, um, of this book deal. And I want to dig deeper into what were those first months? You know, what was the first, um, what was that, that first day where you decided, okay, I'm going to go solo. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to open my own lettering studio or, you know, freelance business as an artist. I want to know a little bit more about those first few months. How did you, how did you navigate those, and how did you get your first lettering gigs and uh, your first clients coming in? Yeah. So, I think when people hear about someone quitting their full-time job and going freelance, oftentimes the stories get sensationalized. Like, oh, one day I just woke up and I wasn't happy and I quit and now I'm super successful. <laughs> and I was raised by very cautious parents. Um, I don't know about you or anyone listening, but they had the best intentions, but very cautious. So even as someone who does take risks in her career, and if anyone who is creative takes risks, that's like the heart of creativity is sitting down to a blank page or screen and going for it, right? Mm, yeah. So for me, I wanted to have the most seamless transition possible. So when I realized I was not unhappy at that six month mark, right? I started doing all those things, like I mentioned before, while keeping my full-time job for a couple more months. So while I was putting together my lettering portfolio, right? Um, in like a more serious way, because I had been doing a couple, you know, lettering gigs on the side here and there, little freelance projects. I'd say nothing, nothing bigger than a couple thousand dollars, maybe like a magazine cover was the biggest thing I had done. Mm -hmm. And I started reaching out to agents. Um, that's another thing that I did while I still had my full-time job. Uh, again, saving more of my paycheck to keep building that cushion so I felt more comfortable because money is certainly a big part of when you're considering leaving your full-time job, you might need the money and that's certainly a consideration. So for yeah. me, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to save up as much as I can so I have a bigger safety net, so I have a longer runway in case work is slower. Um, and I do have a funny story to share after this once I actually quit my job. Um, but what it looked like was just slowly like working on my lettering business and getting that together while still going to my full-time job, but feeling a little less pressure because I knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I think mm. that a big moment for me was looking around, uh, you know, a couple months into the job and realizing that, okay, here, here are people who have been here for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they look just as stressed out as I do. Like, I don't know if anything's going to change. And so I was doing all those things while I still had my job. I ended up getting in contact with a couple agents who emailed me back uh, and 
signing with one before I left my job. So I was getting all my ducks in a row. I guess that's like an American expression. I don't know if <laughs> it's a German expression as well. But uh, I was doing that while working my full-time job. So it was definitely a chaotic three months. But, you know, when you really want something or you're determined to get out of a situation, you just kind of put your head down and work towards... You're, you're very motivated, I can say that. Because um, it's just... It's so easy... You know, when, you're, when you get into work and you're talking with your coworkers, people oftentimes are like, you know, how, how are things going? And you're like, oh, they're good. We all say that things are good. And we don't really, we're not super honest with each other, especially like even, even as coworkers, right? Or in, in the creative industry, like how's freelance work? Oh, it's good. Um, but I, that, that's why something like this podcast and blogs and when artists get really honest and open, I think that's when you can have a lot of breakthroughs because there's so much stuff going on all the time. And there are things we can change and little things we can do to make our creative work better. Um, so yeah, I think th that's what the first, first couple months looked like of making that decision. But I think you might have also been asking, like, when I actually left my job, I remember waking up the first day on like a Wednesday or something when I uh, didn't have to go to work and it feeling so weird. It felt so strange to just say, wait, I don't have to go anywhere today? And the first couple weeks were fine. I had, I, so the way that my business has worked for the last decade, I don't have clients on retainer. Um, I don't know if you do, but for lettering, it's very much like gig to gig, um, I would say for yeah. me. And so I knew there was no guarantee of work per se, but I had, I had lined up a couple of gigs working with this new agent. Um, and so that felt really good. But then as those slowed down a little bit, I started, you know, even when it slows down a little, you're like panic because you're used to having a consistent income. And I had my money saved, but I was still, again, very risk averse, very cautious because of how I was raised. I ended up getting a part-time job as a dog walker in Brooklyn <laughs> the first couple months after I left my full-time job. I was making like $15 an hour walking dogs. And I was like, okay, I'll get exercise. You know, I'll get to hang out with dogs. Uh, it'll be good for my health. And it's only a couple hours a day. And then I can go home and do my freelance work. And that's actually what I did for, I was planning on doing it for as long as I needed to, to feel comfortable. Um, and honestly, to have something to occupy my time. Because oftentimes going from full time to completely freelance where maybe you don't have to work that day, can be jarring from a lifestyle perspective. So I started walking dogs and luckily as I was walking dogs, client work kept coming in and ramping up. So it got to the point where I was like taking client calls on dog walks and I was like, okay, I think I, I, think I need to quit my dog walking job. <laughs> I, I love the story because um, I think that what you said before was on point as well that, you know, I, often we hear these stories and these are the stories that I, I like to kind of throw light on and understand how the artists got there, where they are right now. That, you know, often we hear these stories of like, okay, I, I you know, I just decided to go freelance and I launched my website and then he client work started coming in <laughs> and this, this, this doesn't really happen you know it's like it's really a process and um, I think it's so important to hear these stories because it's not always like okay I started my freelance business and everything just happened overnight but it's more of, of a process also a process of not only like getting cons consistent work but also getting used to the the state of being a freelance you know you go from being an employee to becoming your own boss mm -hmm. and that really requires like a change of mindset and a change of attitude and a different structure in your life right and I think it's great that you point that out oh yeah a hundred percent I think you know in in today's age of you know needing to grab people's attention very quickly and distilling your story into a little sound bite Oftentimes it does sound like, yeah, I just I was unhappy and I quit my job. But like you said, lots of little steps, putting yourself out there, making personal projects and publishing them. Um, like you said, taking the initiative, like the employee mindset or being your own boss, you mm -hmm. taking the initiative to not wait for someone to give you a project or opportunity, but to create your own where it's like, OK, cool, I'm really interested in food and so I'm going to make personal work about food and put it out there, put it in my portfolio, share it to my social media, talk about it nonstop, right? Say that I'm, I love to do illustration or lettering work in this area and 
yeah, it's not going to happen overnight, but you're planting little seeds and they're going to mm. sprout at different times. And so that's, I think that's what you, that's what freelancing requires of you is to just be consistently planting seeds and being okay with not knowing when they're going to sprout, but knowing that you're consistently putting, putting that out there. <laughs> um, and I wanted to comment on your point too about saying like, saying what you want to do or what you want to be out loud. Like oftentimes uh, in my own life and in a lot of my students' lives, as a creative person, it's so easy to get caught in your own head when you're, especially when you're alone and a solo freelancer, you have all these thoughts and these ideas and they're just kind of bouncing around in your brain. Writing them down is oftentimes a good step to like organize them, but speaking them out loud to another human being is really, really powerful. I was just uh, talking to a class the other day about this. I was saying like a marketing strategy that I encourage anyone and everyone to do is, let's say you want to be a lettering artist or you want to paint murals. Uh, anytime you meet someone new and they ask, hi, like I'm so-and-so, like what do you do? Or you know, what have you been up to lately? Talk about yourself as a lettering artist or a muralist. Say what you want to do and let people know because the other day I was getting my hair cut and I was just chatting with my stylist and we ended up talking and I told her like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm painting this mural and she was like, oh my gosh, I know a couple people who have been looking for a muralist. So you really never know who's looking for the skills that you are offering. And I know it seems like, okay, social media is the only way to do that. But even offline to friends and families and people you interact with in your community, it can be really, really powerful. Word of mouth marketing is still one of the strongest types of marketing. Absolutely. And I want to touch on marketing just in a minute because yeah. I know that you have, you you know, you describe yourself on your website as a lettering artist with a knack for marketing, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but before that, I want to touch on the different income streams that you have built within mm -hmm. the, your business, right? So um, just because we were mentioning, we started talking about um, your path as a freelancer and how you started getting those freelance gigs um, and you engage uh, with this agent, right? But you also, I think you also were pretty intentional in terms of building a business that is not only based on client work. And you had a very entrepreneurial attitude towards your freelance business, right? You were not always or I, I have the, the, the feeling I can see that from the kind of projects you do and the kind of things that you put out there that you are very um, you are a kind of entrepreneurial in what you do totally entrepreneurial in what you do you have your your online classes you also um, you have your speaking gigs your client work right so I want to ask you a little bit about how did you build those income streams if this was an intentional thing is something that you strategically decided to um, build your business on or is something that just happened organically in your uh, life as a freelancer I think it happened organically um, and I can walk you through kind of the slow, again, the, the little steps I took to build this kind of multifaceted business. So as someone who started out just doing lettering work and, you know, I guess you can tell from the earlier stories that I was uh, recounting of, I was okay getting a part-time job as a dog walker, right? I'm willing to do other types of work to be able to sustain the fun, creative work that I want to do. and. I guess, man, you opened with such a good first question because everything is driving back to that original question about how do you make a living from your art. Oftentimes, like, there's so many strategies where you can, some artists are better at compartmentalizing where it's like, here's the work I do for money and here's the work I do for me and like for mm -hmm. my creativity. Some of us blend it more together. I'd say I'm more of a blend, but in this case, I was doing my lettering work and I slowly started to build an online following because I was doing client work and then simultaneously doing these fun passion projects that really got people's attention because through a passion project, I get to be the client and the artist. So I get to say whatever goes, right? Which was what I was so frustrated about in an agency because I had very little autonomy there. It was just whatever the client wanted. So 
doing these personal projects. So for example, um, I did a project in New York where I wanted to break into chalk lettering. So I did a project called We'll Letter for Lunch where I was going around to restaurants offering to redo their daily special sign in exchange for whatever this daily special was. And that was kind of like my little fun barter program. I would do one of them per week and post them to a blog. And that helped me break into chalk lettering um, mm. with freelancing. And so as I was building this online audience, naturally people started emailing me and commenting or messaging me on Instagram asking, hey, how did you do this? What's, what's the technique for this? And I'm, I'm an open book, so I would just share and they'd be super happy about it. And I started building rapport with people, which eventually led me to, I was like, okay, enough people are asking about the same thing. Maybe I'll teach a workshop. And I will say that Living in New York City at the time was a large like contributing factor to probably why I was like, oh, I'll just teach a workshop because there's so many designers in New York City. And I think yeah. that if you live in any crea like creative hub, like a LA, New York, like Berlin is a creative hub as well, you know? I yes, think it's a yeah. great place, like there are great opportunities to be able to teach in person there if you'd like to or host events. So I started hosting lettering workshops. Um, I'd rent like a little event space and host workshops for maybe 20 people at a time. And eventually that grew into, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit tired from hosting workshops all the time because it takes a lot of effort and energy out of you. And I love meeting people, but there's only so much, like there's a, there's a limit to how many people I can teach per month yeah, um, in yeah. person. So I was really struggling with this like, desire to teach more, but the capacity and like my lifestyle and how much can I actually give, which is another skill you need to have as a freelancer of knowing where your limit is. Because I saw you post in your, on your Instagram the other day that like as an artist, you need to take care of yourself because you are the core of your business, the thing that makes you money. And I, I absolutely love that. And so that's where online teaching came into the picture because I was like, okay, the only way to scale how many students I can teach is to put this curriculum in one place that people can take digitally. And yes. I wonder if it'll translate digitally and lettering because it's like a tabletop skill, you don't need a ton of materials. It worked really well for that. So I hope that paints an accurate picture of the little slow progression from me just doing freelance work to eventually monetizing that same skill uh, but just in different ways. So teaching, teaching was where my personality naturally led me, um, I think. And yeah, now I teach a bunch of other online courses. It also, like you said, led to, it's interesting, once I started teaching more, which involves speaking in front of people, I got invited to speak more at conferences. So that was another organic component of that. I guess the more, the more you do of something, you're building, you're building all these kind of tangential skills that you might not realize that are valuable. Um, so mm. when people realize they're comfortable talking in front of a class, they're like, okay, maybe she's comfortable talking in front of an audience. Um, and it ter also turns out that when you teach, you're demonstrating your expertise in an area as well and like your command of the skill and medium. And that also, like teaching also got me clients as well because a lot of my students it turns out work at companies that need lettering or design sometimes. <laughs> it was this in very interesting like ecosystem where like different connection points were being made. <laughs> yes, and I love that you, you also use or reach out to your audience to understand what did they want from you. You know, I think I always say that there is a very important aspect of being successful as an artist and making a living as an artist that is not only doing the work you love, but also finding that thing that the people want from you. Because oftentimes we, I feel that oftentimes artists, we stand up or we stand in the position of like, I just want to do the work I love, right? But you also need to find the people who want to buy that from you and yes. want that kind of work from you. So I think the overlapping of those two is where you really find joy and also a way to sustain yourself as an artist, right? And I think that reaching out to your audience and the people you work with, and as you said, talking to people around you, you were mentioning that talking to your, um, to your hairdresser <laughs> was also a way of understanding what their needs are and if they need you know, mural uh, painting from you and then get those uh, gigs coming in, right? So um, I think there's a, a truth in that where you, you're not only doing the work you really enjoy, but also 
listening to what the people really want from you and appreciate from you, right? And um, I think that's, that was a really great way of um, kind of building your, your, your amazing set of online classes that you have right now. You have, you know, you mentioned your passion projects and you have a class about passion projects. You, of course, have a class on, um, on lettering. You also have this class on mural painting, right? So, um, and talk, talk, about, uh, talk about this class a little bit more because I think you're opening registrations for that course right now. So I would love to hear how did this class came into play and what are you offering this class for your students? Yeah, so yes, the mural painting class is open right now as we're recording, <laughs> but yes. it was something that, like I said with the lettering class, like organically, what are, the, what are the questions that people are asking me the most based on the work I'm already doing and sharing? Um, you know, from a marketing perspective, like uh, I was just telling my students the other day who have an aversion to the word selling because um, it feels scary, you know, what if instead of selling, you're just sharing what you're doing, right? Mm. You're, you're mm. simply sharing. Um, and so I started answering questions about murals because people, it seemed as if there wasn't a lot of information out there. And for me, when I was first starting to get into them, as you can probably tell already, everything in my career is very DIY, like figure it out, like how can I start it on my own without having to jump through all the hoops um, or get like an apprenticeship or something. And so oftentimes when I was starting out, I was, I held myself back because I was like, oh no, I should, I should assist someone else first before I begin painting, or maybe I should try to find a mentor. But even in New York, it was tough to do that. And so mm. I just started painting big canvases in my home, and then I got permission from my landlord at the time to paint a wall in my apartment. And so I started building my mural portfolio up, and now I'm teaching other people basically everything that I wish I had known when I started. Um, so people who are in a similar position where they're, they're a designer, just some kind of visual artist, maybe you're doing you know, small scale work, you're working on a Wacom tablet, Photoshop, whatever it may be, um, iPad, but you would like to learn how to scale your work up and turn it into murals. Uh, that is, it's called Mural Painting for Designers and I named it that because it is for designers. It's for you if you already have some kind of visual art skill, but you just want the tools to be able to scale it up, um, work with clients, charge for it, because I guarantee you that the second you post a mural on your Instagram, people are gonna be like, hey, okay, they can do that now. Maybe I should hire them to do this. And it's always mm -hmm. helpful to know how to price work like that. So that's kind of how this class came to be. Um, and so if anyone's familiar with my work or you like the kind of murals that I paint, that's what the class is teaching. And I was really a little nervous at first when we shot it because I was like, you know, with lettering, it translated really well digitally, but mural painting is much larger, right? It's mm. a lot more like, we were like, okay, how do we shoot this so people can see the way I'm holding the brush and, you know, the pressure that I'm applying. And so it's a much more hands-on class. We had multiple cameras going and it was a, it was a lot of fun to shoot, but it's basically, the process of me painting a mural from start to finish here in my studio. It's not the mural behind me right now, but it was a smaller one off to the side. Um, but yeah, that's the class and I open it twice a year and it is open right now, but I know we're recording right now. So if anyone's listening uh, and it's a couple days later, you can actually email me and I'll, I'll give you the special Martina Floor podcast. Uh, late entry <laughs> amazing so we are gonna add this to the show notes so that um everyone can find the class and i think from the outside perspective when you look at an online class you think okay it's i don't know it's 10 pre-recorded lessons and with this 10 pre-recorded lessons i am supposed to learn how it goes how how to go about creating something, right? But it really takes years of work to really figure out how this is done. And, um, and also to just take the bits that are really important so that you can include them into those 10 pre-recorded lessons, right? Yeah, online education is so interesting to me because it works really well to get information to a large number of people. And the accessibility is very interesting to me because you know, you might need to, like if I was gonna host a mural painting workshop in person, I would need to go find 10 big boards oh, yeah. or walls. Um, I could probably only have a couple people at a time. And it's just, 
it, it would be expensive for each person to attend. It would take a lot of my time, a lot of their time. And I think that designers and creatives, like visual creatives, are already pretty resourceful. Like, even if you don't think you are, you, you're mm. probably more resourceful than the average person. And so I think that when the information is presented, like even though it is a lot of information in a organized, concise way from somebody that you trust, right? That's a big part of it too. I tend to take online classes from people who have a track record, right, of what they're teaching. They can prove Absolutely. that they've, they're doing what totally. they're teaching and I like the way they talk. Like my teaching style, similar to how I'm speaking on this podcast, is very informal. I like to teach like I'm teaching a friend. And I actually think that that's a big selling point for an online class too and I encourage more artists to teach because oftentimes when we think of a teacher, uh, especially like an art professor, right? It's, it's someone who's older and has 20, 30 years of experience um, and it's maybe a little bit mean, <laughs> but I think that getting to learn from someone that you have fun around or trust or feels like your friend is also really comforting um, and a, just a different mm -hmm. learning environment. So yeah, the class has been very successful so far. Um, it's most, the most fun part for me is the student projects are so big and beautiful so there's like all this amazing visual proof of like okay someone took the class and then they went out and painted this mural it always just like makes me feel so warm inside because oftentimes you just need that little nudge as an artist to like whether it's encouragement from a friend or just your own internal like i'm just gonna go for it you need that little thing that's gonna push you to do something and make you feel comfortable doing something and oftentimes once you you know, put the first bit of paint on the wall, you've broken the seal, and then it's not so scary anymore. Often, the number one thing I hear is people feel like paint is very permanent. It's not like something you can erase. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them, yeah, you can absolutely paint over paint. Paint is the eraser for paint. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you did it with your own studio, right? You yes. actually, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I love that 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 concept. So we're gonna add all of this to the to the show notes so that people can find the class. And I want to go back shortly to what we were discussing before, before going into the income streams and mm -hmm. how did you develop all all of these classes and different things you do in your business. And I want to touch on marketing and I can totally see that you are a person who is not afraid of talking about what you do and uh, how great you are at doing certain things or the talents you have at communicating stuff and I love that from you that you're not afraid to talk about who you are to say that you're a learning artist um, and um, and I want to ask you what are the things that you feel first I wonder really if it was this was like this from the get-go. Um, or if you had this talent from the get-go, or if this is something you developed um, throughout time. Uh, so that would be the first question around this. And the other thing I would like to touch on, which you can just follow up after, after that question, um, is what are the things that you feel you did right in terms of putting yourself out there and promoting your work? Um, and you mentioned some things already, like passion projects and sharing your work, but what are the other things that you feel that you do consistently and you continue doing nowadays that um, you feel are really um, have a positive impact on your business? Okay, I will go for the first question and then I'll follow up with the second. Uh, so I actually was a pretty shy child and so I don't think I was always great about putting myself out there per se. Um, however, I think that I've always been comfortable like either leading or being in front of people. I'm, I'm more extroverted than introverted even though I spend mm -hmm. a lot of time alone as a as a freelancer and a creative person, a lot of my creative hobbies are kind of isolated, but it's fine. Yeah. I like it. Um, and then in terms of what I do consistently, I really do think, I, I was just talking with a friend about this. One, one thing that like we were talking about, like if, you're, if freelancing might be a good fit for you, is if you are naturally a people person, you might be a better, like you might be a good freelancer or freelance might be a good fit for you because when you think about getting students or getting clients or getting opportunities uh, with brands or whatnot, 
all of those opportunities are going to come from people. And so, not, I don't want to say networking per se, but just genuinely being interested in people, liking to talk to mm -hmm. people, getting to know them, being comfortable going to conferences or meetups, um, or just j like dropping into someone's DMs, right? And saying, hey, I just stumbled across your work. It's incredible. I just wanted to say, keep up the good work, right? If you're a naturally yeah. friendly, encouraging person, uh, which I think that I am, um, that will serve you really well in your freelance career. Similar to the hairstylist thing I was talking about earlier, uh, I, I had this big project a couple years ago with uh, Lara, ba Lara Bar? Yes, Lara Bar. It's this like granola bar company here in, uh, in the States. And it, I had to do this big 3D mural. I made it out of like paper mache and paint. And it was really, it was one of the more, most fun projects I've ever worked on. And it paid really well. And people always ask me how I got that job. And I got that job because... I went to a Halloween party uh, at my friend's house and met her roommate who worked for the brand. And I kid you not, I remember, I'm, I'm, I remember this so clearly because that night I was supposed to go to that Halloween party with a couple of my friends and they all canceled last minute. So here I am in my apartment wearing a hamburger costume, right? <laughs> and I was about to not go because I was nervous to go to a party where I only knew one person, right, the host, and without my friends with me. And had I not gone to that party, I don't think I would have gotten that job. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, that's just one story. I'm sure there are plenty yeah. of parties I've gone to where no work or <laughs> students or any money has come out of that. And I'm not saying to go to parties just to try to make money, but <laughs> if you, are comfortable putting yourself out there in whatever way, like maybe mm. online, offline, right? Um, if it one-on-one, -on -one, in a group, small group, large group, whatever it may be, uh, it is so beneficial to just getting to know people is good for business. It really is um, in just yeah. a friendly way too. Uh, and yes, there are things like doing personal work, passion projects. And when I say passion project, the best way I can describe it is it's like a small series of work underneath the same topic. So instead of just one piece where you felt inspired one day to draw you know, some cats or something, uh, maybe you do a series of 12 cats um, and there's some interesting theme that you're, and style that you're putting it underneath. That's how I define a passion project. It's almost like a, an album of music um, or like a gallery show, right? Um, those are yeah. other kind of ways I've described it, but just a container for your work so passion projects, getting to meet people, of course. And then, you know, I, as someone who is comfortable in front of people, my one fear though is I really hate performing in front of people. So singing and dancing, you will never ever see me singing and dancing. If you see me singing and dancing on TikTok or Instagram, something has gone terribly wrong or I'm just a completely different person <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm very bashful about that. But I've noticed actually a lot of my friends who were in theater or, or perf the performing arts in middle school and high school, they do quite well on social media now because they're comfortable in front of a camera, they've got these animated personalities. And if you've got that too, that's also very helpful. But I'd say at a bare minimum, being comfortable, get, being comfortable getting on camera and just talking to your audience in not a performy way, but just in the same way you might record a video for a friend, like with an encouraging message. Like, Martina, you're so good at this too. Whenever, whenever I see your videos online, it feels like you're talking directly to me. You don't have to have, you know, the YouTube like, hey, or like super energy. You can just be yourself. And oftentimes I find that the more comfortable you are just being yourself online, it's almost like you're, you're speaking on a radio at a certain frequency. And you're going to yeah. attract people who are tuned into that same frequency. And that's exactly what you want. You likely will yeah. curate an audience of fans and followers and clients and students who vibe with you. you. You're not trying to get everybody. You're just trying to curate this community of people who feel like you feel like home to them. And I think that that's what's really special about the Internet is that we're able to do that. There's plenty of bad stuff about the Internet, but that's one of the good things. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I wanted to touch on something that you just said, which I, I think you will resonate just for those listening that, you know, you were mentioning that or you were encouraging our listeners to 
get comfortable in putting yourself out there. And I have mm -hmm. to say that, you know, when you mentioned that you see me on a video and um, and you feel that I'm, it's, it's just Martina talking to people, mm -hmm. right? And I think it really takes a time to get there because it's it's crazy, but sometimes, and I don't, I don't know if this happens to you or it, it comes natural to you, but it really took a time for me to really show up as myself. Sometimes like be yourself is, kind of like the hardest part of everything like when when <laughs> when the camera turns on you're suddenly like okay how should I act is my hair okay like you know and really becoming that natural you when you're um, performing in a way because you are performing in front of a camera but really being yourself really re requires you to just show up often and try it out do it repeatedly and it will come out Right? Ooh, um, I have a good a good tip for your audience because this is something I've been sharing like privately and it's really resonated with mm. people and I think that I'd like to share it now. This is the first time I'm sharing yes, this little tidbit do. because it's a really powerful reframing of social media that's helped me get more comfortable sharing over the years. Yes. So when when I first got on social media, I thought about it like, okay, going on the internet is like going out in public, right? Other people, anyone can see me and judge me and talk to me. And it feels like that energy feels so overwhelming, right? Um, if you're an introvert yes. or you're a homebody, going out on the internet can feel daunting. But the reframe to me now that I, I'm seeing a shift now where instead of seeing social media as when you post on Instagram or wherever, it's not going out in public. I'm choosing to see it now as when I post on social media, my social media account is like inviting people into my home. This is an open house, I've opened my door, and people, yes, anyone can walk in, but they're coming into my space with my people, mm -hmm. and this is not a space where you can just do whatever you want or be mean to other people. Um, and if you don't like what's happening in my house, you can mm -hmm. leave and go to someone yeah. else's house. And I feel like the kind of conversations I have when friends come over or when I feel comfortable with people or when a group of us are just talking and feeling safe and having fun, that's when some of the most powerful breakthroughs happen and connections can happen. So I'm choosing and I'm encouraging others to shift your view of social media to not you putting yourself out there in public, but you inviting people into your own creative home. And it'll change the way that you speak because think about the way you speak when you go out to an event and meet people for the first time. It's like, hi, you know, handshake, nice to meet you. Like, what do you do? Whereas when you invite people into your home who maybe like you have a friend who brings a friend, like it's a lot more comfortable and you can relax a little bit more, you know, kick off your shoes, be yourself. And I encourage everyone to give that a try because you'll end up attracting way more fans and way more people who are on your same wavelength if you do that than trying to perform for the general public because you cannot please everybody. And there will always be like that one or two people out there who leave mean comments and try to discourage you, but don't pay them any, any business. Um, there are always going to be people like that. I think that's such a, such a great... Um, perspective on social media I think because um, I think that if you try to like everybody um, you would just train yourself like you would try to become a different person whereas if you just try to connect with those that are you know your people and as you said your friends you will be much more natural um, and much more aligned with who you are right which is you know, at the end of the day, you want to be yourself every, everywhere, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as, as someone with a large audience now who mm. I'd say I've, I've mostly been myself online, it can be hard to be your full, full self sometimes because yes. there's just a lot of like, okay, well, I still need to appeal to potential clients. Uh, there's lots of things that go around in your head. But the sooner you start being yourself, like, you know, at at 10 followers, at 100 followers, whatever it may be. The sooner you start being yourself, the better actually, because what you don't want to happen is, you know, you, get, you have 10,000, 100,000 followers, but you've built that on being, you know, a filtered version of yourself that doesn't feel authentic to you. And then you try to be yourself, Absolutely. you're gonna piss a lot of people yes. off, but it's not, it's not you. Like you, you're still, you're trying to be yourself, but it's just the curation of your audience. So if anything, 
being yourself and it's okay too like it, it's better for you to piss some people off and have them unfollow you because they would have been problems down the line anyways and when i say problems too you're just not aligned on either values or tone of voice or whatever it may be there's so many people in the world we can't please everybody so the sooner you, you act as yourself the easier your time on social media will be in terms of the people you attract and how you enjoy engaging with them because you know there's so many people where there were, i feel like there was a point on instagram where it was all about like responding to every comment and mm. because there were so many comments people would just say like love this or a bunch of hearts and it all became very empty right mm. i'd rather have some meaningful conversations or connections once in a while than having to frantically respond to everybody with a generic message per se so i think yeah. that the sooner you can be yourself the better experience you'll have curating your work on instagram and fostering a community Yes, that makes a lot of sense, and uh, also a, a, a good use of your time, right? Um, yes. I was I was thinking that I wanted to touch a little bit on this because you have a big growing, uh, um, big following on social media, and you know we we naturally went in the direction of social media, and I love to dig deeper into that before we we wrap up this episode, which is it seems that you have had. Um, you have gone through a journey in your use of social media and the way you show up on social media as well. So I wanted to ask you, what are the things that you feel um, have changed in your approach to social media besides this, um, this more intentional use and kind of connecting or dedicating or investing time only on those conversations that you want to um, nurture um, but uh, what are the things or the boundaries that you have established around social media that allow you to continue you know um, talking to your audi uh, audience uh, but also keep um, keep a healthy relationship with that you know if I'm being completely honest it ebbs and flows for me there are periods where mm. I feel more active there. There are periods where I feel like I don't want to open my phone. And, mm. you know, a lot of that's based on, you know, if work is stressful at the time or if there's stuff going on in my personal life or there's, you know, a lot of awful things happening in the news. Like, it can get very complicated with, you know, my mm. life as me and then my online life as well. Um, mm. And so I do know it's a really powerful way to attract people to me and my work and I see it for that and I think that one of the healthiest like approaches to social media that I have is just remembering that social media is just a tool that we can mm -hmm. use however we want like the interesting thing is you know you'll you'll hear advice from lots of people that all have a different approach to how you should use social media but there's no one handbook right on how you're supposed yeah. to use it the frequency, the kind of content you should share, what you should absolutely not share, your how much personal life, right? How much business? And remembering or always reminding myself that, yes, I use social media to promote my business. My business, I am the face of it, but I am mm. not my business. So for me, mm. I post when there are things to promote, of course. Um, I try to post, I allow myself to post other hobbies and creative things that are kind of tangential to my creative practice. Sorry, there's, yeah. a, there's a bird on my windowsill right now. <laughs> it's very loud. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> We are not going to oh edit that. <laughs> I want, who knows, maybe it's, it's, I don't know, mating season. <laughs> But anyways, um, for me, yeah, I, I try to use social media when it's, like, I'm more likely to use it when it feels fun, like I'm posting to friends, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where that, that mm -hmm. mentality of curating a space that feels like, this is my home, You're, I'm welcoming you into my creative life. The boundaries yeah. that I've set for myself personally, uh, I do not share much of my personal life. So me mm -hmm. and my boyfriend, I don't put any of our relationship online. And that's very intentional because, you know, social media is a sliver of what we, a sliver of a sliver of our lives and on the flip yeah. side you know there was a period of time where i saw my instagram as just business right so i'm only mm. sharing business advice i'm only sharing my artwork and that's 
that's a boundary that worked really well for me for many, many years. And you know, you yeah. hear advice of find your niche, what's your target audience, serve your people. From a business standpoint, that 100% works. There was mm. a certain point that I hit where I felt like I was over identifying with, see, I was seeing myself as just, like the only value I could provide to people was business advice and art advice. Mm. And it started making me feel weird. So I relieved myself of the obligation um, because you know when you're your own boss, you can make the rules um, and same with your <laughs> audience, right? I don't ever feel so indebted to your audience of like, oh, what do people want from me that you neglect what you want to? You should absolutely take into consideration what people want uh, because your business, it's part of your business. But in terms of how you show up on social media, Ultimately, you're going to show up when you feel like you're being authentic and you're sharing what you want to share. So at a certain point, I started allowing myself to share more crafts and hobbies and other creative things I was doing. Um, and that made it a lot easier for me to share on social media again because it was fun. So I guess my best advice too is you will likely need to rewrite your own boundaries and rules with social media or anything mm -hmm. in your business as time goes on, assuming you're going to have yeah. a you know sustained 20, 30, 40 year career, however long it may be, you're gonna have to change the rules uh, or adjust the rules from time to time. So for me, it's all about keeping it like an enjoyable, an enjoyable place for me to still share stuff. <laughs> and that's also like a perfect segue to something I, I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, this new interest that you have in your life. I heard that you are gonna pursue a culinary school next year is that yeah, correct is that yes. parent uh -huh. and i you know and i want to ask you a little bit about this because i thought it was so um courageous from you just to to share that on your social media whereas up until now we have identified you always with as you said sharing things about lettering and growing your skills in lettering but also you know the business side of things and you have studies speaking about this new interest of yours and perhaps even pivoting careers at some point of your life. So I want to ask you a little bit about this and what were the things that made you decide just being open about it and also pursue this new path um, in within your creativity? Yeah, um, it was a big one. So I, rem I, I had a realization that um, like I was, what was, what was it? Oh. I was talking with a friend and uh, you know the question of like if you didn't if money wasn't an issue right like if you won the lottery what mm. would you do with the rest of your life and oftentimes people ask that question as a way to like try to find like oh what are you really passionate about what do you like to do yeah and we were talking and I I just kind of casually said because my I've always had the same answer even though like I did go into lettering like because it's always been a it's always been kind of a joke but I've always said, uh, oh, if I won the lottery, I would just go to culinary school and host dinner parties all the time <laughs> if I didn't have to work for money. And I think it was this weird, uh, you know, I think weird timeline. So I was, I was thinking about that and talking about that with a friend. And then the pandemic happened, right? Uh, and so I had some time to sit with that. And I think, you know, Lots of feelings came up for all of us, right, during the pandemic. Some people had a, you know, oh my gosh, when faced with my own mortality, maybe I should shift gears and try something new, or I'm not really happy, or, you know, I'm so grateful to have the current job that I have. It brought up a lot of things. For mm. me, I realized that, oh, I don't have to win the lottery to go to culinary school. I can just do that if I want to. Yeah, yeah it costs money, but it's not lottery money. <laughs> and so I realized that I could take the money I had made from my lettering business over the years and invest that into another skill. And it was different this time from, you know, when I was unhappy in advertising, as we were talking about at the beginning mm. of this chat, I'm not unhappy doing lettering. I yeah. just feel a, a, a little pull inside of me that there's more that I want to explore. There's more I want to be challenged by. I don't know if you've gone through this in your own career. Um, because you've had such a long career in lettering, but I'm still interested in lettering. I like to do it. It's still fun for me, but it's not as 
exciting or challenging as it used to be. And I think mm. it's just because it's been 10 years and maybe it's my personality type or whatever it may be. But I did have a realization. I was in this, uh, I was in this mastermind uh, a couple years ago and I had a really big, big breakthrough in there because I was talking with some other entrepreneurs who were not in the design industry at all, which is so helpful. Talk to people who are not in our industry. You will get some really fresh perspective. Yes. And I remember talking to them about my, this feeling I had of like, okay, I feel like I need to keep doing high profile client work in order to you know, have the credibility to teach classes um, about art and business and stuff. Mm. And one of, the, one of them turned to me and told me though, they were like, oh, but like, um, and I was talking about doing just lettering. I was like, I feel like I just have to, you know, find my niche, focus on my niche and like keep doing what people know me for. Mm. And they were like, well, but if you expanded and like let yourself try other things or talk about other things, like what if you could be like, you know, the next uh, like Martha Stewart or the next like, you know, someone who did a lot of creative things. And I was like, oh, what if by holding on to this old identity as just this one thing, uh, I am limiting myself from whatever my potential could be. And because I feel that, I feel that creative pull to try other things. I've, I've been a lifelong home cook. And it's something I've always held close as a hobby. It's something I like to do that relaxes me. But I think, yeah, having time to think about it during the pandemic, I realized that this is something that I know I'm going to regret not trying. And I'd rather do it sooner rather than later because I'll just have more time to figure it out. And I don't know if it's going to be a full pivot. I don't think it's going to be that. I think it might be either incorporating my art into food or the food into art or somewhere in between. But I'm kind of on this path of not, know, I, not knowing what's going to happen. And that's exciting for me because the last four years of my business have been fairly like rinse and repeat, like predictable, which is actually, you know, mm. it's funny. That's what you want in business. You want predictability, you want consistency. But for me, that sometimes cuts against the creativity and the fun and maybe it's just the way that I'm wired or maybe I'm just looking for a new adventure but it is true I am going to culinary school in six months it'll be an eight-month program and then I'm still I'm still planning on doing some of like running my creative business and seeing what comes in but I will be in school part-time um, I think classes four hours a day, five days a week. So I think, I well, think that's the a next, bunch. That's a yeah. lot of time. Yeah. Yes. I think that it'll be a nice container for me to focus on this other thing I'm passionate about, see if I want to explore it as a career, how I might want to incorporate it. I figured worst case scenario, I just come back a really good cook um, and I've spent some mm. money. Uh, best case scenario, it opens up a completely new creative path for me and yes a new way to explore and find some, you know, satisfaction and enjoyment and just new things. It's definitely tough creatively because I, I like new experiences, but I also know that finding new experiences over and over and over again, like can get exhausting. And so I don't know, I've, I've, I've self analyzed a lot in this area of like, okay, like I still like my job, but like, why do I feel this pull to do something else too? And I don't have the answer and I'm okay with it. And I'm, I hope that by sharing openly, you know, on, mm. in my emails and on social media, and I will be sharing some of the journey, you know, along the way when I'm in school talking about what it's like, I hope that it gives people some insight into like, here's a person trying to figure it out, you know, taking some risks in her creative career. Like it's a good reminder for me to like, you don't have to wait till you've hit rock bottom or burned out from your job to explore something else. If anything, burning out from my first job made me aware of and realize that like, oh, that's a bad place. I don't want to be there. So I don't, I don't want to wait until I, and I don't even know if I would get to that point of like being yeah. completely burnt out from doing lettering and like design work, but I want to see if I can explore something new too. Yes. And also I think that, you know, I can totally resonate with that once you get, um, you get put or you put yourself as well into the category of a lettering artist or an illustrator or a 
graphic designer or whatever <laughs> category you're in, it's really hard to let yourself go out of this category and just <sighs> explore other creative adventures, right? And I think that, you know, if, if anything, um, running a creative business, I think it's a great opportunity for you to have that container to explore your creativity. I always say that if anything, I have created this business just for me to be to have the freedom and the flexibility to kind of yes. go in the direction I want to go with my creativity but it also takes a lot of courage to just go after the things you're interested in because as I said you're put into these categories and you feel that if you leave that category you're gonna lose your identity and perhaps your identity is to just go in and out of different categories right so yeah it's oh it's so hard especially because with you know the digital landscape of seo or uh, out the algorithms on social media yes. everything about those the way those are built incentivizes us as creatives to put ourselves into a box mm. and it's not entirely bad i think from from a marketing standpoint even offline having a clear you know this is what I do, or a call to action, or like a, a, an easy way to describe what you do so people remember you. Like, that's always important, but especially in a digital world, I feel like I, I have so many conversations with creatives who feel like this niche or this label that they chose for themselves is no longer, like it used to feel empowering and exciting and like, yes, I am an illustrator. I'm a real illustrator. And now it's like, okay, but I'm also, a potter and I'm also a, a painter like am I allowed to peel the label off and the answer is hell yeah you can peel the label off or you can peel the label off and just revise it right you can add a plus sign or an ampersand um, I think that oftentimes you know when I don't know what it was like with your your family or what it what the culture is like uh, over in Europe but here we see careers like I look at what my parents did and that generation Careers are supposed to be, you pick one thing and you do it for 40 years and that's a successful mm -hmm. career. And I think for yeah. the younger generation now, we're having a little bit of a identity crisis where it is, okay, well, I've been doing this for five, 10, 15 years, but I'm curious about this now. I think it's because the internet has shown us all these other ways we can make money or run businesses or things to try. And I think that what I'm planning on doing or what's likely going to happen for me is I'll have a couple different, you know, like like acts of a play, right? Like the, a three-part act. So I'll have like my lettering and design and then maybe I'll go through a culinary phase and then maybe there's a final one that I don't know about. I have always joked, oh, maybe this is predicting the future. I've always joked with my friends that when I turn into a grandma, I'm gonna start learning how to be a tattoo artist because I have a lot of tattoos and I think the idea of a tattooing grandma is cute. <laughs> but maybe my, my motor skills won't be as good anymore. <laughs> I love that. I love that you think of your career as a three parts or a multiple parts play. And I think that you have also built a a business and a container for that to happen and you can take it in any direction you want and I love that kind of attitude you have towards you know not to put yourself into categories um, which I think is really freeing and really a great decision as a creative um, just to allow yourself to explore any creative venture you want to explore right yeah the allowing part is a big part like you said you mm. know you built this business so you could have the freedom to try lots of things and do the things that you like feel called to do. And I think I always tell people too, the label and the box, like the container, however big or small, a very small, like tight knit niche worked really well for me yeah. for five, six years. And then it didn't. Yeah. And I always want to remind people that, you know, doing a lot of things or doing one thing, no, neither is better or worse than the other. It's just you as the artist, need to be in touch with yourself to know what's working for you and what's no longer working for you and be willing to adapt. And there was a point where I was nervous of like, okay, well, if like, what if all of my followers are just following me for lettering? What if I start mm -hmm. sharing other stuff and then they all leave, right? There's the, a little bit of that nervousness. But what in turn happened is, well, that didn't happen. And then I'm now attracting people into my orbit or people who 
were following me just for lettering are also going through the same thing where they're like, hey, I like other stuff too. So they're like, my audience is evolving and changing with me. Like they're, they're not mm -hmm. static or they're not static human beings because people just aren't that way. And so don't be afraid to change things up or add something in or take something out. Um, don't let the idea of, oh, but my audience will be disappointed stop you from doing what you feel pulled to do because your audience will grow with you. They're also free to leave if, if you're not aligned anymore and you'll likely attract people into your audience who are, again, on the same wavelength or radio frequency that you're putting out now. I love that, Lauren. Before we wrap up the episode, I want to play a little game with you. You have shared Ooh. so many great stuff with us <laughs> today. We, we had touched on almost everything, marketing and social media and culinary school and your life as a child and your family and everything. So I appreciate everything that you have shared with our listeners today. So I want to play a little game, which is complete the sentence. I don't know if you ever play this. Yes? Okay. Um, so I start the sentence. How is it called? You said? I think something similar is like Mad Libs, where it's like a, a, a sentence, but you fill in a word. Ah, okay, yes. Okay. So th mm -hmm. this one is like, I start the sentence and you just complete it, okay? Okay. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope I don't say anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, I could get, I could never get bored of. Ooh, uh, I could never get bored of going to the grocery store. <laughs> yes. I'm extremely good at. Coming up with new hobbies to try. <laughs> I'm terrible at. Typing. <laughs> A lot of typos or. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, so fun fact, I don't know how to type properly. I type like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So hi, everybody. I run a successful business and I don't know how to type. It's okay. You can get by. You don't have to have the <laughs> skills, but it is next on my list because it would be more efficient if I knew how to type. <laughs> there's hope. There's hope. I know. So my, my friends always laugh at me because... Uh, oh. Why do my friends laugh at me? Uh, because I make a lot of fart jokes. <laughs> <laughs> my partner always tells me that. I forgot to screw the cap back on the toothpaste. <laughs> oh man, it, it makes him so mad. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'm going to... Be a chef. <laughs> <laughs> right now is the perfect time to oh what is right now the perfect time for uh, call your grandma amazing so thank you so much for being on the show today uh, <laughs> Lauren where can people find you Thank you for having me, Martina. Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere online, Home Sweet Home. It's like home sweet home without the E's in home. Uh, nice. So it's homesweethome.com. You can find me on Instagram at that same handle. I'm not really on Twitter, so don't even bother. Um, I have started pinning more stuff on Pinterest, though, lately. Um, that's mm. something I've been experimenting with because I am a pretty avid pinner and so I thought I'd share more stuff there um, so you can find me at hey home sweet home because home sweet home was taken somehow it's always a bummer when your handle's taken you know and you have to oh, put yes. like a underscore or a number or some other word I know yes <laughs> but you have yeah, to that's react you fast when a new social media platform shows up you have to react fast at least log your um, your handle I've actually heard of parents even getting their kids' names as handles once they're born. Oh, totally. I, I got my, my kids' uh, Gmail account already. Oh, my goodness. And they're like three and five. So You're it's like, You're such a digitally yeah. savvy mom. I love it. I would do the same. <laughs> Great. So I will add all of this, all of your um, social media handles, your website, your um, uh, mural painting uh, course to the show notes so that listeners can find you. I so much appreciate the time that you have been chatting with me today and I bet that our listeners will appreciate all the wisdom that you have shared with them today. 
Thank you, Lauren, for being on the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and see you on the next episode of Open Studio. Bye-bye. So this is it. I hope you loved this episode. You can find me, the host of the show, on social networks, at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have a question or comments, go to martinaflor.com slash podcast, where you can see previous episodes, find show notes, and send voice memos with your comments and questions. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. Just go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube to find them. You can, of course, listen to all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. If you loved this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening and see you in the next episode of Martina Flores Open Studio. Bye-bye.